And I always now show my students that, and I think it's also a really great opportunity to talk, actually, I'm here today, to talk about, um, you know, uh, representation. And he was in a, a tractor, a tractor exploded when he was a kid, that's why he's got facial scarring. Um, yeah, he nearly died. Uh, and the fact that, you know, he, he is still internationally renowned and has made an amazing career, um, you know, it's a good demonstration of how inclusivity can work. Um, does that feel helpful? Yeah. <laughs> I, I particularly, I like the, uh, again, I like the middle section, because that's much more up-tempo to uh, Hillary Hunt's wallowing down. How is yeah. it? I, I felt that, it felt like it had more line. But the thing is, I don't think the two recordings because I think Hillary Arm was trying to do it more as a kid's version, yeah. yeah. And that is just one of the way out of it. Yeah. In, yeah. On every, you know, this, you know, fingering, the shifting, the everything about well, it. Well, double stops, it. different keys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah. the bow. I mean, you know, yeah. just, you know. You I mean, it's like a lesson on the time triangle, isn't it? You, you can just it. see it. Happen. Exactly. And if you, I'm sure some people sort of look at that and say, well, why isn't he on, he's on the fingerboard? Yeah. Well, if you look, why isn't he? So it would be <coughs> problematic in some ways, you know, if you've got, I've got quite well, a few colleagues saying, Most of the other kids who understand it's more than one way to do things. It's actually, to do with yeah. just, you know, yeah. things you could do. I mean, uh, um, have you ever heard Art Tatum play? Uh, no. Yeah. Which is yeah. hilarious. It's and it, utterly brilliant, but over opposite of that. Right. Well, I mean, one day we can just sit here and watch different videos of Susie pieces because I think that is really interesting. Is but it better? Perhaps not today. <laughs> Which is how I've always felt it should be, like much more kind of showy and less introspective. Um, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So for the video, in case anyone is confused about what we're talking about, we just watched Augustine Haberlick play Humoresque. Uh, yes. Which is... Amazing, but art Tatum is the opposite type of amazing. Okay, let's talk about between teacher and parent. Parent and teacher. I mean, there's not that much new stuff to, you know, we no. just look at different ways to cover the same thing uh, many times over. Uh, okay, so lecture number two. I think the thing about this is that as it becomes more and more familiar to you, you do need to remind yourself that every parent, almost every parent who comes into your teaching studio is going to be unfamiliar with it. And so that's partly why we're going to read so many different versions of a similar idea, is so that you can find different ways to talk to people about something for when the way that you kind of fall into the habit of talking about it doesn't work. Because for, for most of us, we have a kind of standard way to explain things and talk about the philosophy, and that works for most of the parents and students that we work with, but then occasionally there'll be someone for whom that just really doesn't like click. Um, Okay, so, I mean, it's interesting that the assignments as well to learn with love is a great book, but I think, again, one that's out of print and it's quite, has anybody read it? I think I've got it, I think. It's quite, um, yes. could have done with a good edit. Yeah. <laughs> the, William, the William Starr book, yeah. yeah. There's a lot about their children in it, which I think is kind of nice to read. But if what you're after is something quite pithy. Is that the big one? Yeah. Yeah, the big one. Yeah. 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 I haven't read the cover. Yeah. No. I've read the cover. And you know, the thing is, I think one of the things we've got to remember is if you're talking to a new parent of your student, a new a new student's parent, you're suddenly asking mm -hmm. them to listen to a 
25 minute recording every day and try and practice every day, they're not also going to be like, oh yeah, please give me a like 150 page A4 size book to read as well. They're going to be like, oh my goodness, that's just like a very big change from their, you know, the amount of stuff they've had to do in their daily lives before with their children. So bear that in mind, I think. But that, it would be, uh, it would seem to me that it's, as interest grows, you can then guide people into using that. Yeah, and that's why little bits is really useful to, to kind of start them off on that, that you're like, oh yeah, that's really good. And it's enough to start off with, but then you hope that they're going to want to research more and find out more from that, rather than trying to give them the whole lot. Yeah. Straight on says that this one is the name of off actually in the first paragraph is a very interesting oh, the discussion is uh, it says a written assignment requiring parents to record their impressions and thoughts about the book. Mm. Oh, and I thought that's quite um, <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> I mean imagine saying that to my parents. Yeah. <laughs> I think the thing about this is is that you know that my favourite word is coming out again. There is diversity in our families as well as in our teaching. Mm. And I mean, I remember one of the very, like, a strong memory I have of kind of starting out with Suzuki Hub is one of our very wonderful teachers saying, you just can't, you should not accept parents who are not going to practice at least five times a, a week. There just is no place for them with, with professional Suzuki teachers. And I was just like, I actually think if we ditched all of the families who didn't practice five times a week, we'd have about 40 families left here. And if you're going to be... You know, you have to all, each of you has to decide for yourselves what kind of teacher you're going to be. Maybe you will be a teacher who won't teach anybody who doesn't practice every single day of the week. And maybe if there is some reason that they stop practicing every single day of the week, they're going to have one month of grace before you're like, okay, out, goodbye. There are, pe there are teachers like that. Their students tend to be very good, but I feel that that's not really a true understanding of Suzuki philosophy. And then there are teachers who never, never actually bother to kind of find out exactly what's happening at home, which I also think is a misunderstanding of Suzuki philosophy, and I think that there is a balance to be found in the middle of that. But you know, I'm very aware that when I first started teaching, I didn't know exactly how many times my students were practicing, I didn't know how many times they were listening to the CD, and when I started to find that out, the people that I thought were practicing every day for probably half an hour to 40 minutes, some of them were practicing for 20 minutes three times a week, and they remain some of my most brilliant students. And you know, I just think, well if I had been saying to them in book one, how many times have you practiced? Well, it's still not up to seven, so I'm gonna, you know, send you to another teacher. I would have missed out on the like privilege of teaching those particular students because some of them can just do it in much less time than others. Yeah, isn't it? More, you know, it's isn't it more about whether the pupil is actually achieving what you would expect at that level, and you know. Well, I think that is the pers that is the personal choice to make. Is it about what they? Is it about if you think it's about them achieving what you expect, then that is about kind of broad, broad spectrum. This is roughly what you should be doing, and if that takes you five minutes or if that takes you an hour, that's what you need to do. Or is it about everybody should be putting in the same effort? Effort, mm -hmm. and then if you are you know, talented, mm. or if you find it easy, or if you have extra support at home, you will excel further, and if you don't, you will go slower. You know, I think it's a balance for us all to find, and most of it comes out in the wash without us really being super aware of it, but occasionally you do have those families, like the kids I was just talking about, who make you think, oh wow, yeah, you really have, you know, I mean, this child did grade 8, age 14, and got 139. And I don't think he's ever practiced more than four times a week. Mm. And really not for very long. Should I have said, no, I won't practice, I won't teach you because he could have done grade eight when he was nine. I got 142 <laughs> if he'd done half an hour every day most days of the week. I, you know, that, that wasn't the right decision for me. But other people would be like, God, what a lost opportunity not to have excelled even further. But so it, it's for us all to work out for ourselves. Isn't it also that you, you've got to, um, it's not really for you to dictate how a family lives its life, you know? No, but it is for you to dictate who you're having to teach yeah. and who you're not. I mean, it's slightly different here because if you just said, right, I'm not going to teach anyone who doesn't practice for half an hour every day, I mm. would be like, well, I'm afraid this isn't the place for you because I, even I don't ask for that. Mm. And we, 
I'm not, it's a nice you know, we're yeah. an inclusive organisation. We're not running a music school where people get to call the shots to that extent that they can be really hardcore and just sort of ditch people right left and centre. <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, I mean, there are people who run their studios like that, and from by certain ways of assessing their success, they're very successful. I was going to then say, for me, in other ways, they're not successful. It depends it's on, how, you know, how much of an economic safety net you've got as well. If you've it depends on just, just, just saying, sorry, yeah. I'm not teaching you, you know, even though you're quite good, but you'll only do, you won't do enough practice for me, then you must, somewhere at the back of your head, think, I've got enough. Yeah, absolutely. I think, well, economically, um, and I think also it does depend on your understanding of Suzuki philosophy and your general outlook on like social justice and equality and equity because absolutely guaranteed if you end, if you end up running your studio with that really hardcore if you're not meeting these demands you're not in my studio you are going to have a very upper middle class mm. studio because it, 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 that's just a fact you you may have occasional outliers who are able to meet your requirements without being middle class, but generally those families are, you know, the ones, it, that's just how it's going to be. And for me, that doesn't sit, that's not what I want, that's not my interpretation of Suzuki philosophy. It's, you know, but again, there are plenty of people all over the world who have very successful studios who are almost exclusively upper middle class and therefore in this country mostly white and mostly, you know, in West London. <laughs> It is, a, it is a kind of, it's, it seems to me if you're going to start picking and choosing your, your, uh, your students based on their family's willingness to jump through the hoops that you ask them of them, it's, it's quite restrictive and constricting, it's quite it's a critical case. But then you, can, then you can say you've got a really successful studio and then you can sell books on the back of it and you can still do you know, it's it does it, just, it does it just, that's it, what i'm saying it's just it's oh, for each of us yeah. to decide and it's also you know about your skill level if your skill level is not high enough to require those stuff you know if you've got a studio yeah, full of people who practice every single day and listen every single day and they still don't play very well then that's not going to work because yeah. parents will take their students elsewhere their children elsewhere um but I mean, I would definitely hope that if you did. Like my mum says, if you've got a parent who does everything you ask and you still can't turn them into a decent musician, then you really should be in a different job because you've got everything going for you. Um, but you know, for me, I think, and the other thing that has happened a lot here in discussions with teachers is teachers saying, well, they don't want to do it anymore, so that's up to them. And I'm like, but they're seven. Like, isn't it part of our job to re-motivate them to reinvigorate their desire to do it at least to try mm -hmm. and for me i felt really strongly that that kind of well if they can't build this practice i'm not going to teach them which is a direct quote from someone who used to teach here and i was saying to her but don't you feel that you can encourage them to practice what about using sticker charts and you know very young children and, and, and she was just like, well, if they don't want to, what's the point? And I was kind of like, well, I do see your point. I can see what she meant. But I feel, for me, that's not Suzuki. Like, part of Suzuki is teaching long-term delayed gratification. And you cannot show that to a five-year-old. That When you're 13, you're going to be really sad that you quit. <laughs> like, you just can't show them that. Mm. You have to find other ways. Yeah, I mean, isn't it just a child being a child. I mean, that's one of the things that I find teaching small children sort of nice, is that you can't really um, get cross with a seven-year-old for yeah. behaving like a seven-year-old. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you're behaving like a child. <laughs> oh, wait a second. Yeah, exactly. You know, you're behaving like a seven-year-old. Oh, you are seven. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think, you know, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation is really complicated. And yes, we all hope that part of what we do will be intrinsically motivating to the students. Maybe they love group, maybe they love playing together, maybe they love the sound, maybe they love performing, maybe they love going to concerts and thinking, one day I'm going to be able to do that. But, you know, like I say to the parents, every parent education course I do, the number of students I've had who want to practice for the purpose of practicing is about three, and I've been teaching for 25 years. You know, like, that, if that's what you're hoping for, you're probably going to be disappointed. And how about we try and change the...
prism through which you're looking at this and think, you know, if your child didn't want to brush their teeth, would you be like, okay, fine, it's up to you, you don't have to brush your teeth. Well, no, you wouldn't because then all their teeth are going to fall out. But if you want your child to be a musician, you can't just be like, as long as you want to do it, it's fine. And then if you don't want to do it anymore, you just don't do it because then you will not have a child who will be a musician. 99% of the time, the kids go through some period or other of wanting to stop. And if you just let them drop it as soon as they want to, then you're not going to have a child who's a musician That's on any level. That's the influence of thinking of the violin on an instrument as being a violin club. Yeah. And because it's so, so I've just got the, the, the part in this that said, you know, because we're so inclusive, because we're so loving, and that can seem almost as if you're taking your foot off the gas, that people assume that it's, oh, it's no big thing because it's not got that kind of pressure. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, if you're not checking with the parent, you can get this, well, it's not worth the fight then. All these fights I'm having with this child at home to come and practice, they're not doing it. They don't want to do it, therefore they won't bother because it's only my link mm. um, And I'm getting that from when I used to teach in certain schools mm. and hearing that from some parents and going, no, no, I can't, what did you just say? <laughs> I think <laughs> that happens a lot more in schools yeah. than it does. Yeah. Um, but I think that attitude, because their kids are also going to clubs in schools, yeah. it's just a general attitude that, okay, yeah, just give it a go and see what they like. Yeah. Which is perfectly fine parenting, you know, like, I'm not denigrating that as a philosophy of, you know, like my child did some dance classes, she didn't really like it, so she's not a dancer. You know, like, I could sit here as a dance teacher saying, well, unless you commit to it and make your child go to dance lessons every week, you're not going to have a child who's a dancer. Well, no, I'm not, but I don't feel about dance as I, did, as I do about music. So, of course, there are loads of families out there who don't feel that this is worth a fight. And I do think that there is a certain point where if a child makes it really clear they won't do it, it does become more damaging. You know, I had a child come in with their mum and the mum was saying, make him do it. And he was eight years old and he had put his foot down, wouldn't touch the violin, literally would not touch the violin. She tried everything that the teacher had asked. She tried everything that I'd recommended and I had to say to her, I'm sorry, love, I can't make him do it. I literally cannot manhandle him to pick up a violin and play. You've tried everything I've recommended. He just does not want to do it. So you can't make him. There is that point in some children's journey, but in 90% of the time, it's about something else, or they're stressed, or they're anxious about learning the next piece, or they're kind of falling out with the person they stand next to in group, or, you know, like, whatever. It's something completely separate, and if you can work out what that is, then you can get them back on track, and then they will become musicians. Not professional musicians, obviously. They'll become people who can play music, which is, for me, one of the gifts I want them to have. It seems to me from the perspective of the parent, the teacher, whether you're one on one or whether you're in the, in the triangle with the triangle with parent, the big question you should, you should be asking me is what my, uh, the phrase my, my sister has used, what's within my gift for them? Mm. And what's within my teaching gift for that, that situation? What, what can I do? It's, Putting the going back a few discussions a while back of, of every child can if and the problem there's there's pro problems with every child can if because if you put an if in there then you it's very easy as a teacher to go I absolve my responsibilities because they're not practicing it's not my fault because of this it's not my fault every child can if. or if you look in that situation and say within this situation what do I have at my disposal and what is within my gift for that moment. And mm -hmm. there is loads within the Suzuki method, it seems to me, that was it that could create the gift that you can pass on and but some things you can't just ram gifts down people's throats. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, yeah. 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 It won't be accepted. It has to be it has to be pertinent to the time and moment which will come, I'm hoping, with experience because it will you have to practice how that gift is for you and how it is for different people. Yeah, I mean, I think the hardest thing, and one of the hardest things with the philosophy is getting the parents to accept that they are as responsible for their child's progress as the teacher. Because I think it's very much, certainly in the upper middle class circles with mum and parents, they're very used to just paying for a service. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
and you Absolutely. know, it's, <coughs> they give you money and you teach your their child the violin and they achieve, you know. That's the classic, you know. Time. My child needs to move on from Malagrasso. We've yeah. been on it long enough. <laughs> it, 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 well, okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and it, so it's, it's the idea that, and, and, and sort of trying to get away from that um, mm. with some, some parents who, who they really don't want to have to accept that their child's development is wholly dependent mm. on what's, what they're doing and how they're leading their lives and that. And it's a big thing, isn't mm. it? You know, I mean, it's... So, uh, and taking that yeah, board, that's, that's if, if, you're, thing, if you come yeah. across that as a moment, what is then within our power to affect that? Yeah, that's how, exactly what I was going to say. How do so we affect that? Because if it's, if it's purely down to them and they're the only people responsible, what's the point of us being in the Well, world? no, she wasn't saying that. I wasn't saying that. But, but, I wasn't but, saying that. So, but then when, how it's do we... It's just to say that it's, it's a triangle that needs to be balanced. Yeah. You know, and if one element isn't there, it's... You know, it's, I'm not saying it's going to collapse, but it's it's going to. The work as well. Okay, so progress. let's take a moment. Just find yourself a blank piece of paper and write down as many things as you can think of in that situation. If you realise that you're teaching a student whose parent is basically sitting back and letting you get on with it, not really taking the time or the energy in whichever way you would like to imagine this scenario, either not making time for practice or not listening carefully enough in your lessons to what you're saying you want them to do, or, you know, practicing in a uh, inopportune times or in a really grumpy way, or wh wh whichever problem you want to imagine, what are you able to offer that parent in terms of support to change that up, to make, to make that work better for them? And just take, let's just take three minutes to think about that. So you need to imagine what the problem is in your scenario and then what possible solutions you could offer. Scenario: the, uh, the parents finding it difficult to engage the child in practice sessions. Okay. Um, so I've had like you can give them practice games that they can do with their kids. 
good. Um, you can get them to sort of build the tower mm -hmm. and stuff like that. You can give them matchsticks that they can swap the sweets. Um, you can do sort of shorter practices more often. Mm -hmm. um, eliminate distractions and things like that. So make sure uh, there's, I don't know, like you switch your phone off or put it on silent or something yeah. um, so that it's sort of clear that those are really sort of focused like this is an important time that we set aside for practice yeah um have those markers that he was talking about in the book like sort of beginning and ending each practice session with a bow or mm -hmm. something like that and between those times that's the focus yeah very good well done kit um what's your answer about practice what's the problem in your imagined practice they don't want to practice okay they're not interested in what they're playing mm -hmm. Maybe like see if they want to play something different just to change it up a bit and mm -hmm. just so that they enjoy something for a bit and then try to get them back on the task. Mm -hmm. um, uh, see if like ask the parent what time like when they're setting when to schedule and maybe try a different time to see if Good, that works excellent, better. yeah. What do you think, what does the group think, not necessarily you on the spot, if um, if there's a child who doesn't want to practice, what is one of the main reasons that you think, oh, let me just check, if it's because... Or when they're being asked to told to practice. Yeah, can be, when they're going to be, when when it's being, you know, if it's 6.30 yeah, for a boy child. Maybe they should favourite programme or something. Yeah, maybe they should, yeah, there's something that they're missing because of that time. And tired or hungry. Yeah, go tired or hungry, excellent. Toilet, <laughs> Toilet yes. Yeah. One more thing about how the parents are behaving. behaving. Maybe the parents, the parents not, interested. not really fully engaged, they're trying to make a cake at the same time. Exactly, or, or they're, they're not being or... positive, they're yeah. not offering the encouragement that the child needs, they're sort of being disdainful. Mm. Uh, it's very interesting, disdain is a really interesting sort of um, behaviour, isn't it? Like there's this long-term study into couples that get divorced versus stay together, and mm. one of the very few kind of reliable markers is disdain. Mm. It's not whether they row, it's not how they got together, it's not how often they have sex, it's not, you know, all of those kind of things that you might think, oh yeah, you know, you can't have sex for two, it's definitely on the way to divorce. Like, but actually, does it, like being disdainful of someone is really so powerful in like crushing your self confidence. And if you think about how often, like it happened the other day when a kid did really well in his solo concert, he hadn't done so well in the rehearsal, and his mum went, and I just felt like, oh babe, he's done the right thing, and you're like, he didn't see, otherwise I would have talked to her. But you know, you, he's done the right thing, he's stepped up, and you're like, why did he screw it up in the first place? You know, and I think that that is really key to often children don't want to practice because basically the messages they're getting from their parents are like, what the hell are you doing? Why are you messing around? Which may feel like what the parents feel like. They might be like, well, yeah, they are messing around. But, you know, then that just becomes a negative cycle. And so I think to, you know, what solutions can we offer if we, if we aren't sure what the problem is, why a child is not wanting to practice? How can we find out? Ask the child. Ask the child, very good. Also, ask the parent. Yeah, yeah good. Yeah, so then people in the room at the time, aren't they? So it's, you can ask pertinent questions. If it's not directly asking why don't you want to practice, you ask them things around or when the practice is. Is it that sort of day? What, good. How do you start your practice? Good. Um, how do you have any troops for your practice? Excellent. Kit, what else might you want to ask? Um, I'm trying to think back because I was never a good practicer, if I somehow managed, but I would say I did a Suzuki method. Um, but I think step out of your experience and think about if you've got a child who's saying, I don't want to practice, and the parent's saying he doesn't want to practice, we've covered, you know, have you given them a snack, or is it late in the evening, or... Asking the, the child? Yeah, asking the child what, though? Like, like obviously they're really young, they're just like, they feel like, 
they know what's happening around the bus and why they don't want to practice. They're still interested in everything and then just go from there. Yep, good. And is there anything that you would like to do? Like, you know, for older ones, like if they're pre-twinkle, you can't really, you know, you can give them different games, I guess. But like, you know, if they're kind of nine and yeah. but two, like, well, you know, I've had students, I just don't really like the pieces. Well, okay, would you like to learn a Beyonce piece at the same time? <gasps> you know, totally kind of transformed it to do like just an easy version, or they want to play a Christmas carol, or they want to play, you know, whatever. Like, I think that you can, you know, find out what the child is wanting. Um, I to be in kids who are just, um, and this was actually done because of Isaac and Helen, actually, I had a real think about it, and I, and I was exploring about how to, get a child to appreciate the, the, the concept of delayed gratification. And I, and I, I asked one, a kid at school, because uh, he was just not working, and I said, so who benefits, and it, this was something I read, it wasn't just me, and I said, um, who benefits, who benefits if you work hard? Mm. And he was completely floored by the question. Interesting. Because he, and he ended up saying you do, to I do, right. me and me. And it was really, really interesting. And um, because then I managed to say, is there anything you've done that you were really proud of that took you a long time? You know, it's, oh yeah, I made a model or something like mm. that. How long did that take you there? How did you feel? Just get them to. But I think that aside from that, from the kids, I mean, I would probably go in deeper and say, ask the parent, why do you want them to learn the violin? Mm. What is it about the violin that's important? Because yeah. if the kid is getting all screwed up about practice. It's maybe because the the, the, ch the parent is not appreciating every small step. And that is precisely what they, I was going to say. They want yeah. to leap or to take be grade one level, rather than saying, oh "My God, you've made you've managed to keep your bow holes perfect for the whole twenty minutes." Yeah. Um, yeah. They're kind of missing the whole point of the thing. Yeah, exactly. I think that's really wise, and I think the other thing that often is missing is that the parents are feeling very appreciative but not verbalizing it and sometimes that just doesn't it's not enough for the kid to kind of notice that the parent is smiling you know they literally need like look at your bow hold i really noticed that you've made such a brilliant bow hold or i what i'm really appreciating today is that neither of us has got upset today so we did get upset didn't we so it's so much better today let's see if we can do that again tomorrow um, and you know, I think that we're so used to, it's sort of, as an adult, it's really cringy if you verbalise how much you appreciate about everyone, one person in that situation, if you verbalise everything that you appreciate about them. And some parents do this all the time, and other parents very rarely do it. And I think for the parents who very rarely do it, you've got to really help them. And you can practise in the lesson, you know, like after everything they do, right, Dad, what did you notice was good about that? And literally practice, you know, saying it and noticing it. And you know, some parents find it difficult to even see what the good things are that their children are doing. Um, but I think that positivity, and I think the other thing that really often plays into unsuccessful practice is just the clock is ticking, everyone's stressed, and we're trying to get out of the dog school. And you know, so then you either need to find more time or you need to set fewer, um, uh, think activities in practice or you know you need to kind of coach the parent in how they can actually keep those time stresses to themselves and express their appreciation and the fact that this is special time together to their child and do they know what to practice because mm. that could be also stressful yeah well, you did it in the lesson lessons. can't you just do it again yeah yeah, yeah. and that is extremely helped by practicing practice in the lesson. You know, like, I would like you to make five bow holds. Can you just show me how you're going to make a bow hold together? Not, I would like you to make five bow holds. Okay, what should we do next? Like, this is really, really crucial and something that I don't think happens enough in most people's teaching, including myself, probably. Um, yeah, so I think acknowledgement, like, if we look at page 11, Adults begin parenthood by finding delight in each small achievement or skill their baby learns. 
Sometime, however, between infancy and adolescence, delight gives way to expectations as children are forced into the regimentation of school, completing homework assignments, being accepted in soccer team, blah, 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 blah. So teachers and parents who can maintain the exuberance over each small step and avoid the temptation to focus only on the leaps will produce more willing, happy, and enthusiastic students. And that's really crucial. That thing about um, when she talks about task-based thinking and ego-based thinking, mm. that's really interesting. Mm. Yeah. The, the idea that the, the child who's um, doing it for the end goal only yeah. is more likely to make excuses about why they're doing it. Well, oh, I, I, can't, I can't do that because I'm doing that or I'm doing this. I mean, I've seen that. I've seen that in some of my pupils. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting. I just, it, it's the same Beyond the music lesson? No, the, the next one, the Teaching mindset. Teaching with an open heart. The mindset. Mindset, right? mindset. yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's changing the mindset, isn't it? Exactly. And I think really helpful for the parents can be, you are here to learn how to be a really good practice parent. Like, I'm not expecting you to just be able to do this. You know, I think that we often do just expect them to be able to do it. And when we think about what they might not be able to do, we think about the technical aspects of you might not be able to get the violin on the shoulder properly, you may not be able to help your child make a bow hole properly, you might not be able to tell them which note is which, you know, correct pitch. But do we actually really take on board that they have to learn, just like we are learning now, the philosophy of how to practice with their child, how to be the encouraging person, how to celebrate every small step? You know, that's a big thing to learn. Just like learning how to make bow or good boy one is a big thing to learn. Yeah, and I think it's easy to sort of fail to see that. It's going back to the to be list. Isn't exactly. It? Yeah. Yeah. I think when it, when you when you get the parents to understand that, I think it comes as a big relief for them. Yeah. As well. Because I think sometimes they also they don't want to disappoint you. Absolutely. And God, like, well, most of the time. Yeah, most of the time. You know, and once you say, no, that's fine, you know, look at the way she's standing. Yeah. It's really improved, you know. Yeah. That's, I think it's a big relief for them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I think on page 14, this is a, just a helpful kind of reminder list, which we've covered some of these things already. Plan your practice to isolate previews or assign spots for extra drilling <laughs> and think of a way to uh, involve, I presume that says, your child in a few perfect repetitions. Roll the dice, one repetition, one repetition for each year of age, check practice incentives including in this book, add a part of Mr Potato Head, build a tower, you know, like you said about the matchsticks or um, Clipping pigs to know, yeah, pigs all sorts of things. Um, and the thing about those is that you'll find one works <coughs> for a while, and you think, brilliant, we found it, and then it just stops working, like very randomly, and then you have to find something else. So you need millions of different versions of the same, in um, you know, encouragement up your sleeves. Play music in your home and car. One of the things I think is very useful is to make a sign that says put the Suzuki recording on. Um, I had to make myself a sign. It's ridiculous. I feel so, I, I still don't really understand why it was so difficult for me to start putting the recording on. And I'm still the only person in my household who does it. <laughs> if I don't say, can you put a Suzuki on in the morning? It doesn't go on. Um, and, uh, you know, I was already running a Suzuki school, so be compassionate about how difficult that is. But, you know, I say to most parents, do you put the kettle on first thing every morning? I don't, I don't think I've had a single person say no yet. And I'm like, okay, we'll make a sign that sits next to the kettle that says put the recording on. And then you press go on the kettle and play on the, whatever it is, your phone or your iPod or, you know, Alexa. And off you go, then it's done. Sing with your family. Singing in the car can melt the miles away. <coughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Never mind. I don't I think, think that works so well for public, public trans 
dance sport. Do, 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 do. Shut up! <laughs> Make a pact with yourself to listen to your child perform one piece each day for enjoyment and relaxation. I don't know really why that has to be a pact anyway. Do not tolerate phone calls or other interruptions during practice. And I think this is a big thing. Most of us are with our phones all the time. And if you get a buzz in your pocket, you will check it. It's much better if you can actually like put your phone in a different room for those 15, 20 minutes. And tell your child that you've done it. It's insidious. It is. Because you, I mean, you listen to, listen to, listen to the Suzuki. How do you put the Suzuki on the little my phone? I don't think it's going to be interrupted. I'm going to need it completely sidetracked by something else in front of yeah, <laughs> yeah learning, wow. learning to use the do not disturb function is very important. Um, yes, and the conclusion is that learning should begin as early as, poss as possible and should be filled with fun, excitement and exploration. The child should be immersed in the skill they are expected to learn. Parental involvement must be present and as we've spent 45 minutes discussing, must be specifically Focused. talked about by you by us. Each new skill is maintained and kept current, as with language, blah, blah, blah. Good. Right, we've done one, <laughs> uh, one of the lectures. Um, I'm missing page nine, by the way. Oh, are you? Yeah. Uh, there's probably one in there. In like you said before, Mimi, are quite optimistic for a lot of the parents, but you can spend some time talking about it in the lesson. You know, well, what are the ways that you're, uh, you're trying to make it interesting and stimulating for your child, and then you can have a discussion about it. <laughs> I mean, some of this, I think, is really, like, over the top. Analyse the space, draw a floor plan, including windows, lighting, and Yes, yeah, I read that up in the first we do do in the parent education course is when will you practice write down each day you know Monday we get home from swimming at 5 30 well then when are you going to practice are you going to practice at you know I really uh, I, I mean this bit because she used to think she's so very strong that parents tend to arrange practice around their own schedules yeah not necessarily the time needs of the child so when I read that I asked the people of mine last Saturday I said when do you do practice the boy is being a bit and then she said, um, when they get home from school, it's usually because they have a bus ride, it's usually about sort of seven o'clock, you know. And I said, can't you do it in the morning? And she said, oh, well, no, because they, as parents, they are on the train at seven o'clock in the morning. So imagine that. Bloody hell, you know, so, And uh, so it's really, you know, and that, you know, because, especially because I haven't had my own children, I, I don't really feel in a very strong position <laughs> to, to sort of advise them on. But I mean, I think that is, you know, if anyone if anyone wants to come in on the parent education course, you're very welcome to watch it. It's on Zoom tomorrow and Thursday from 8 to 9.30. And I have various recordings you can watch as well. But, you know, this is one of the things that we do talk about is like Suzuki isn't for everyone. If you're out of the house at 7 a.m. and you get home at 7 p.m. and you want your four-year-old to learn, when are they going to practice? Yeah, I know. If you have a nanny who picks them up from school at 3.30 every day and she can come to the lessons, then sure, maybe that will work. But, you know, if they're in after-school club and then you do five activities with them on a Saturday and then you go to church and go and socialise somewhere on a Sunday, I mean, how is it going to work? Like, it's just, you know, it is much better. And that is one of the things that, you know, the parent education is there for, is like, you don't want to start on this journey and get all excited about how wonderful it's going to be and then realise that you just can't do it. It's like thinking, oh, I love Miami, I'm going to move to America. Oh, hang on a second, I don't have a visa. Like, you know, there's no point in, yeah. <laughs> you know, you may as well sort of um, 
you've got to be realistic about it and it is a big commitment and it's not going to work for every family mm. and you save them a lot of heartache they realize that or and then if you if you're saying well okay if you really want to do it then how are you going to make it work mm. can you start to work part-time on a few like do you actually you know i mean i've never had anyone say this to me but you know if you think that doing suzuki or music or whatever it is is more important than having a full double family income from both parents, then maybe one of you needs to find a job that you can leave at four o'clock every day. I had once, <laughs> once in one of the schools I used to teach in, I scheduled a time during the parents' lunch break and she worked nearby and she was able to come back for that and then go back. I thought, my God, that's dedication. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But I think the, the other thing is that they, they the children, Children change, you know. They, I mean, th in this instance, that they, they've um, they've gone to a different school and they finish later, you know. So instead of finishing at three thirty, now finishes at five, <coughs> and then there's a, there's a bus ride and that kind of stuff. You know. So. How old's the kid? Nine. Nine. I think just before we uh, stop, just have a look at page eighteen. about resistance and anger. I think it's really important to teach the parents that someday they won't be up to it and they can walk away or they can decide not to do it or they can say, I'm feeling really rubbish, why don't we just do three things, you choose what they are, I'll only say good things about it even if it's you know, something we really should be working on. Let's just do something so we've done something. And that, I think, gets the children to really respect the adult as well for actually being able to say that. And is if, you know, if your choice is between not practicing at all, practicing in a way that's guaranteed to end up with you screaming at your child or doing that, then obviously that's the best option out of those three. Mm. Um, and it's about self-awareness, isn't it? Um, I do think breaking up the practice, you know, which requires you to have longer to be able to fit the practice into, but breaking it up by reading a book or, um, you know, having a snack halfway through or not worrying if they're going to find their favourite teddy does make a big difference to how relaxed they can be. Um, this thing about laughter, I think, can backfire. Some, some children, if they're upset and you say something like, you really turn red when you get angry, they will go ballistic. Yeah. <laughs> because they know that you're laughing at them, not with them. Um, so I would be a bit careful with that. I think a mock tantrum is quite a good idea. <laughs> Do you find you enjoy doing it? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, doing a mock tantrum, <laughs> that could be, uh, I mean, if it's your guys that could tell you what, uh, I, did, I didn't do that, but I said, right, I'm going to put my phone on and just video this lesson. Mm. And that changed his behaviour, because mm. he didn't want it on record. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was the other thing I was going to say. If you've got a parent who's really struggling with practice and maintaining any kind of control and focus and you know effectiveness in practice, get them to video it. It's a really good idea for you to really understand what's happening. Because you may be able to see, oh, well, it's because every time they do something wrong, you tart. And they might be completely unaware of it. Mm -hmm. Or, well, you're checking, you've checked your phone seven times in 15 minutes. Of course they're not listening to you. You're not listening to them. Or... Well, you know, your toddler is running around around their ankles, biting them, of course they're not going to be focused. Um, but, you know, there are some things that get so normalised in family life that you start seeing them. Like, we've all been in restaurants with kids who are just screaming and the parents are just chatting. And you're just like, oh my God, take your child out. And they're just so used to it, they just, you know, zone it out. And, um, and I think so, a video can be really helpful. What do you think of this on um, page 18 when she, she sort of, when you were talking about walking away from the situation? But she actually says, um, I've got a big question mark by this bit. She says, the child must be, uh, not, must be allowed to leave the fort. Uh, wait, she, she says, wait a minute. Yeah, the child must not be allowed, to leave, the must not be allowed to leave the fort of practice session for outside play. And she says, um, when children refuse to cooperate during practice, they should remain in the practice area and should have as little stimulation as possible. That strikes me as quite, quite tough. 
Well, I think the, pro the thing she's trying to avoid is you throw a tantrum and then you yeah. get out early. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same with kids yeah. in schools yes, having their group yeah. lesson at lunchtime. It's like yeah. they play up until they've had three strikes and then you're out and then they're back in the playground where they want to be. Yeah. So you do have to find something like, okay, we're going to practice for 15 minutes. If you can't do the practice, what we'll do is just sit here and, you know, it could be something, do something not like punishing, like read yes. a book, but it's not going to be on your terms, you know, go and... Yes, okay, now you can go and watch TV because practice has been such a disaster. Like, yeah, that's that's yeah. what I think she's trying to avoid. Yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. know what this is doing. Like, well, I've had a similar little moment and it's that very thing, just trying to get my boy off the sofa in the morning, brush his teeth and get ready for school. It tends to massive yeah. friction between us. And it's still going on, he's picking up more. And my partner walked in and said, that's shit <laughs> out I think I should have left that. And it's just, right. You get away and you sit on the sofa and have a couple of minutes. It's exactly what he wants to do. He can't. He can't, he can't. It's like, yeah. we're ignoring that. Come on. <laughs> yeah. It was just, he's, he's not having that sofa. He's not having it. And it, was, yeah. it's, it would have just been a complete, it would have yeah. carried on every day the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know, the naughty step, I think yeah, it's, it's up to each family for them to decide what naughty looks like, isn't it? Yeah. Like they have to decide what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. But you know, we did have a few practices where Tilly would end up on the North Step for a minute or two minutes or whatever. And it was like, she did have to understand that, you know, even though practice was something that wasn't being set by school, it was sort of something that as a family, we decided we were going to do. And when she was naughty in it, there was the same consequences as being naughty, you know, elsewhere. And, um, so I think that's the thing. And I think the other thing that can help a lot in this day and age is to say, these are the things you can do once you've done your practice. Like you can have your screen time after you've done your practice, or you can have your, you know, yeah. your phone or whatever, whatever it is. I think that that, you know, if you kind of, in the same way that a lot of us do automatically with, you know, older kids about getting dressed or um, making their beds or whatever, like, you know, you don't, you get breakfast once you've made your bed, like otherwise you have it won't get done. Um, or you know, you can organize friend time with your friends once you've done your homework on the weekend. Like all of those kind of things can work well for practice as well. And I think the depersonalization thing is really useful, you know, to take it. It's a kind of, it's not a, it's not a well-balanced thing, isn't it? On the one hand, you want to praise the child for the effort when it goes well. And, you know, you don't want to say to a child, oh, wow, your high three really knew what it was doing there. You want to say to them, wow, you really thought about where to put your three and you got it right. But if it goes wrong, you can still say, oh, your three wasn't paying attention. Do you think that you could help it a bit more? So it's kind of depersonalise it for the negatives, for the you know, what needs to work, be worked on and then personalise it for the positives. I think the, end, the parental anger one is a really key point because you'd be surprised. I mean, that's I did that video in lessons, but um, I once, when the, way back when I was teaching people's homes, I had a dad walk in from work and saw what was going on and I was building into something with his daughter and she couldn't quite get what I was asking her to do, but she was very close. Mm. And she could see it, I could see it, and her brother who was sitting in the sofa doing something else could see it. That came in and had a go at her, so much so that I said, look, do you look, you know, this is not very constructive. And he kept going and I said, after a little bit of turn the throw, because she was facing me, she had her back to him. Mm. I could see, she, she just looked like she'd been hit. Mm. I said, would you not talk to my student like that in front of me? And he stopped for a second and I was like, this is how we're going to do this. Mm. And I didn't have to explain, but I was like, he can't see it. Yeah. And well, good on you, because most, mm. most oh, teachers. Yeah. My yeah, heart was just like, like this child just, physically her shoulders went down, but her face was just like, I thought, if this is how practice is at home, or bearing in mind that mum was doing practice with them, he just I was going to say, that's not her. the practicing home, is it though? Exactly. Yeah. But, but he was the one who employed me to teach. And I think even in Suzuki households, it's a good question to ask if there's anybody else's mm -hmm. anger that's involved in that child's session because I've had more than one parent say or child say to me, I have to practice in the toilet because my dad doesn't like it because he doesn't like the sound of it. Yeah. You know, or mm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sex is bad. Would you want to practice in a toilet? Uh -huh. Come on now. Yeah. You know, so I think anger of other people as well. It's not just yeah. the parents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, let's have five minutes to make a cup of tea, go to the loo, whatever, and then. Please do. <coughs> and then I've lost track of my schedule. I oh, probably could finish, I'm going to do this quite reading, but we probably can finish lecture six and then um, do some reading after lunch. offended when people ask me if it's a big birthday because I'm like, I clearly don't look like I'm about to turn 40 and do you really think I look like I might be turning 50? No, 30, <laughs> 30. 30, yeah. Right. Okay, so let's do the rest of this and talk about lecture six and then we will do sight reading another time. So, beating the blahs. I mean, I think, you know, this book is sort of obviously very involved parent education and it's, like we were saying before, up to each of us really to decide how deep in we want to go with <coughs> this kind of thing. I have to say I've never been, <coughs> I've never done a role play ever in my life really? <laughs> with potential parents. Really? Oh, sorry. Or get potential parents to do a role play. Oh, okay. Um, could be fun. Could be fun. I mean, it's the kind of thing that you could do, which would be quite fun, maybe in group class, if you wanted to actually like set the parents something. It depends on the room as well. You know, can you send them somewhere while you play some pieces with the kids for them to kind of discuss a point of. Um, you know, to, to have a discussion about a particular point that you set, like, there is no reason why you couldn't do that here. If you would like to send them out into reception to chat about whatever it is, that's totally fine. Um, but, you know, I think um, it is very useful to have lots of rewards that you can think of. Uh, so let's just go around the room and talk about, like, what are the, we talked Bex brought up a few, Kid brought up a few, um, but what are the um, sort of standard go-tos to help a parent incentivise their child if there is something perhaps they don't want to do or if they're just generally being sort of annoying about practice. Uh, so let's start then. Rewards, treats, stickers. Yeah, good. How would you use rewards, for example, Joe? Give us an idea that you could recommend to a parent. Um, for the parent to use with the child at home, yeah. um, I would say I have a, a mark chart on the wall and every time we did a really good practice everything went really beautifully for a gold star. If you did practice and it didn't go beautifully but it still do, did it, put a blue star. And then you get, at the end of the month or end of the two weeks or whatever time period they decide, they get to have some kind of reward that I think it should be more about the time you spend with the child, mm -hmm. like maybe a day trip or a picnic or something like Very that. Very good. Rather yeah. than food, because otherwise you end up like me. Is that a kind of reward chart? Yeah, yeah but I think but if you a reward chart, but you want to acknowledge when you've had a really good lesson mm -hmm. and the child's behaved yeah. really, really well, and I think that's something that's really good to try. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think the other way that you can use something similar is choose something that you want to do, like, you know, going to the zoo, for example, really good fun, really expensive, not going to work for everyone, but, you know, okay, well, when you have 30 gold star practices, we can go to the zoo, we'll book it as soon as we can after you get your 30th gold star, and so it's not like you have 30 days, and if you've got 20 of them with good practicing, you get the thing, and if you've only got 10, you don't get the thing, yeah. but it's like an incentive to get to that as quickly as possible. I mean, Tilly, when she was little, wanted this 
enormous, I kid you not, this big, massive stuffed tiger thing, toy, that was in our local, book sh uh, local toy shop that she used to walk past every day on the way to school. And it was £100. And we were like, well, babes, I mean, if you want to earn that with your practice, that's going to be a lot. And it was 100 gold star practices. And it took her a year. And she did it. And I'm sure she wouldn't have done a whole 100 gold star practice. And our, you know, version of a gold star practice was quite demanding. Um, you know, I'm sure she wouldn't have done it in a year. Like, it would have been normal for her to get a gold star practice sort of maybe once a week. And she was doing them, like, three times a week because she really wanted that thing. Um, and, yeah, like... When you get 10 blue stars, you get a new book, or you know, I'll take you to the cinema, or you know, we'll go for hot chocolate. But then if you want, if you want to collect the gold ones, you know, something like that. So that there's a kind of differentiation between just doing a practice. Um, that guy's just rising away with a um, sad hand, but it's okay because it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Like so someone had a bike with an extra saddle in his hand. Hmm. Um, <laughs> um, so um, I think that can be a really good way to incentivise good practices. Um, Kit, any thoughts? Um, no, like. I don't know, I think that like if I really don't want to practice it in like in the moment, you know, you've been trying to get them not to do it, trying different things that's not working, you know, just take them for a walk or something like somewhere completely out of the house. And then, you know, on the walk, you know, talk about something different and hopefully maybe near the end of the walk trying to slowly get back into the Yeah, like a reset at home. You know, always gonna do this. And then, you know, you can watch TV for half an hour or something, but you know, just try to get out of the house and yeah, yeah, fresh mind. Good, good idea. Me? Really? Um, I think the sort of concept of the child taking ownership of the task is quite important, so that can be in various ways, like just simply getting them to roll the dice. Mm -hmm. and that sort of I do, I use them, uh, sometimes I've, I've got some practice cards that I fold up, and um, so they have to, they, it might be under a cup or something. Mm -hmm. I've got this one it's from a thing, and, and they so they take they um, they open the cup and they've got this might say five busy busy stops off on the east mm -hmm. and then they uh, do another cup and it might say your choice. Yeah. And then another one they might say reward from you know from teacher and I'm like oh my god how did that get there? <laughs> you know so nice. so then then they. Um, there's always the chance that they yeah, be. So it's up to you if you them. put that little card in there saying reward, but just the fact that that only has something once and it's like, oh my god, is it going to be this one? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's really nice. Yeah, yeah that's that's on, that, 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 that helps. But just anything like it's using, um, you know, building something or something. You know, I, the other day I, I found some skittles that my ex, my, my partner say from his boys and they work really well just so they give me to aim and and it, and it um, I actually I really do recommend such because it, it is really useful because they I put they little little skittles and if they did oh, something if, so if they did something well then they they um you know they got to roll the skittle and, and so there were ten skittles and one of them just obliterated eight of them in one one roll, but then of course, then to get the other two down, they had to be much more careful. And then that whole concept of that you couldn't just go like that. Yeah. The whole concept was that getting ready, you have to aim, you have to take your time, and if you want to do something really precise, just and like Ed Quietman does that thing with pushing his bow along. Yeah. A similar kind of thing, and it worked really well because I, I said, look, see, if you want the good results. You have to take a bit more care. Nice. And that yeah, works really nice. That's the first time I've done it, and I just found the skittles, a, a really old fashioned little wooden thing. So, you know. I was just thinking also they could ro roll that for how many repetitions they can yeah, do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know. Yeah, but they, they get rid of the, um, you know, they got rid of, as I said, the bulk of them in one roll, but mm. then when they've got two isolated ones, then, then I know when it's half, you know. Mm. You know 
Um, yeah, it's nice. That, that, was, that worked well. Yeah. And just things like that, you know, just any, you know, as you say, Bringing you to keep thinking of other things. Yeah. Bex? Yeah, I was going to say sort of turning the practice session into a game of itself, like if there's sort of cards that they've got to sort of work their counter along, you can assign um, each dice roll to a different sort of tricky part in a piece, so each time they sort of roll that number on the dice they've got to mm -hmm. go and play that tricky section. Yeah, very good. So let's get notebooks and just make a list, because <coughs> we've had lots of brilliant things said, but I think let's just make sure that we've got them. <laughs> I think one of the things that we haven't spoken about is doing something like the maze game or the cars where one person moves, you know, your, the child moves if they're doing something well and the parent moves if the child's mucking about. Yeah. And that can really um, focus their attention away from poor behaviour. Um, so, in terms of incentives, stickers, reward charts where you work towards a reward. Screen time. An event. That screen time thing, I have a caveat to that, which is as long as it's phrased in the correct way rather than we're withholding this until you do what's required. Because if you start restricting access, if you're withholding practice is getting away of what I want to do. It's a bit like Absolutely. it's like it's it's Yeah, you earn your reward yeah, rather you, than you, well, it's are, also, you have I'm, a right I'm, to your reward. You have a I'm taking this away from you and you can't have it unless you do this is a very negative impulse and mm. it's quite it's quite conflicting. So it's it's having something which so like screen time it's it's a huge, huge barrier for Is a, it's being wary of what you're doing with that, whether it is a restriction thing, or whether it's being based out negatively, or whether it is an achievement. Yeah, and I think that the leading on from that, that's absolutely correct, Ed. And leading on from that, if you are starting to work with a family where the TV goes on whenever the child wants it on, or there's an iPad that they can access any time, and then you say, well, why don't you make the screen time connected to whether they've done their practice or not? You're going to have to manage that quite carefully. I don't think it's impossible, but, you know, that there's going to be a shift. And for a while it may feel like, but I've always just been able to get this. Why do I have to do that first now before I get this? Um, whereas if you've had a family who, you know, the child asks permission before they get their screen time, then it's much easier to make that shift. Um, you know, but I suspect if you have a family where the TV just goes on all the time, you're going to have quite a lot of work to, to do with them to get practice and routines happening kind of yeah. regularly already. So it might be that might be really helpful for those parents to like yeah. see that that change might be positive. Um, so the car game or the maze game. Lots of people earn sweets or whatever during practice, but it is problematic. There is a childhood obesity epidemic. Um, I think it can be really nice to have a special, you know, especially for the very young ones, a colouring book that they can colour something in every time they do something and they don't colour it in the rest of the time. Again, not because they're not allowed to, but this is your special colouring book. Let's see how, like, you've filled in this whole picture now. Like, it's taken you a month, or it's taken you a week, or it's taken you five minutes. Like, you know, whatever you want to make it look like. But this is, like, a visual representation of the work that you're putting in. And that can be celebrated really easily and nicely. Um, like, making food together at the weekend. Like, if you do five... You know, if you do five, five gold star practices this week, we can make whatever you want in the kitchen. Like, I can help you make a curry or a cake or whatever. Biscuits for your friends, you know. Something that is time spent together as a result of them cooperating with the time spent together in practice. You get to choose what movie we're going to watch as family film night.
making towers, building things, collecting things. Pocket money for older children can work very well. You know, you get two pounds a week if you, whatever, you know. Well, yeah. I mean, I know that it feels, it, it seems uncomfortable, but it's the, it's a, I mean, it's the same screen time, isn't it? Pocket money's not your God-given right. Um, lots of parents I know, the, pa the pocket money, bad behaviour means a deduction from the pocket money. So then it's not specifically to do with practice. It's just like, hang on, you cross the line, you're being too rude to me, that's 10p off your pocket money. And if that's happening during practice, then that means that you've got to address that. Just in the same way as you're addressing it any other time. Um, but you know, it's all, like you said before, different things for different families. And you need to just keep thinking of different ways. So the Skittles is brilliant. Reading a book during practice is brilliant. Um, doing a puzzle, if you've got a little puzzle that you know has like 14 pieces in it or something and they can put one piece after each thing or two pieces after each thing. Um, those, <coughs> those little rubbers that are little... Yeah, um, another thing that works uh, really well but there can be a bit of a distraction of the sticky men, mm -hmm. the magnetic little little bendy men and you can hang them the, every time they do one and put the sticker on it if you've brought a new piece of or something with a metallic stick it to it and then they get to uh, this long chain. Yeah, it's like monkeys. Oh, nice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's thing. Yeah. I, 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 got, I couldn't find any monkeys and then I found these sticky men and, but they they can be a bit of a distraction because they you know they start bending them in, the, in a particular position. Yeah, you know? I mean I think with so many of those things yeah. there's always that tipping point isn't there? Yeah. I think pom-poms can be really cute like you yeah. know once you've got a million pom-poms you can do lots of different things with it. Have you ever bought a little tub of Dye, as in many dices. <laughs> oh right, yeah. No, not, dice, not dice, dice, is the, dice is the plural. Dice. Okay. Singular. Dice with single line. So I, I bought a little tub of dice. Yeah. From Tiger. Yeah. And they're tiny. They're like maybe five millimeters across mm -hmm. the side. And I used to. Oh, I've got to find this thing because it's in one of my boxes at home. But I used to give them in the lesson and at a particular club. He'd save them. Aww. in a bag and his mum said we bought some more at home and it came in about four weeks later <laughs> <You know? laughs> I've got this many you know and um that, that really worked for him and she said you know when we fill the tub we get to go to the zoo or whatever and so he was like <laughs> oh that's sweet tiny. yeah like, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll have to see if I can find them you can also use you know those iron the plastic things that you iron into a shape on a board oh, and then you yeah. pull it out the board you can use them uh, you can use, um, what was the other thing I was thinking of? Beads. Yes. Beads Quite a lot beads. of, you know, the yes. like alphabet beads or just making a yeah. kind of bracelet. Um, yeah. Quite a lot, lots of kids really love paper clips. A uh, paper clip for every good thing you've done. And yeah. You've got like, yeah, because they can make them into like, you know, chains or you can then like, they're kind of great to oh, muck about with, aren't they? And because they're kind of, I think it's one of those things, they feel a bit grown up, and like if you just go, like my daughter did, and take all of the wood paper clips out of the cupboard where you actually need them, then you're going to get sort of told off by your parents because you're like, where are all the paper clips? I need the paper clips because I've got paper <coughs> that needs clipping. Uh, but but if it's like this is something that you've earned and they're multicoloured or they're whatever, you know, then like that's kind of like, well, these are my paper clips that I earned during my lesson and your crappy purple silver ones are over there. I've got multicoloured ones, you know, <coughs> something like that. Um, I know a very wonderful teacher. I can't imagine making this work. I just don't, I'm not that excited about beans. But she managed to get all of her students to be very excited about beans and every time they played one of their twinkle variations, they would put a bean, the whole thing, a bean in a pot, and then they had this big dinner party when they made, when everybody had practiced enough twinkles to make a bean stew that was actually like worth eating because it wasn't five beans. I don't know, they had like 200 beans each or something. Yeah, so the beans beans as well. <laughs> oh yeah, growing flowers is really nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wash the beans first. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so all of these sorts of things can be really, really great. Um, <coughs> yeah, and then there are a few things here. Let the child decide the time and place for practice for a week. It's only going to work for certain families. 
Plan a recital for friends, stuffed animals, etc. Make a program and decorate it. Uh, make a spotlight, cute. Put a small gift in a paper bag. After 50 thank yous during home practice, the child gets the surprise. Practice outside if it's a warm day. Make up words to any piece the child is learning. I'm on page 36, by the way, sorry. Purchase a practice plant. Be sure to buy a very hardy plant. Yeah. <laughs> Let the child plan a week's practice. Make hot cocoa or cold juice to enjoy during practice. Um, here, there is a rule that once you're in book six, you get free hot chocolate every lesson, and my book five students are racing to get sort of free hot chocolate. Really? Yeah! Marky's like, I've got one place to go until I'm on the free hot chocolate book. <laughs> so every week they come here? Yeah, the well, reception is... Group is of, uh... No, but in their private lesson, I ask who ever sits on reception to make them their hot chocolate. And you know, of course, it means that also they get that recognition, they're just like... Oh, Marcia, would you please make Marcia her hot chocolate? Because she's got to book six when you get, and you say it in front of the little ones, and they're like, free hot chocolate? Oh my God, right, I'm going to go home and practice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe we should make it book five, book six is quite far. But, you know, maybe not. I'm interested in the idea of using um, hand puppets and things like that. Because they can, <coughs> you know, instead of them playing to you, the yeah. teacher, it's it, about depersonalising it again, isn't it? And they'll do things for yeah for the this you know Freddy the Frog or whatever. Definitely that, that kind of thing. That's like yeah. there's a lot of psychology yeah. with puppets, which is really really it's interesting. It's really strange, isn't it? Because yeah. you, you think you can't be you can't be fooled into this, but yeah, well, I mean, you're, you're utterly invested in it. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like that's right. And it's <laughs> it, it's really um, it can be really effective. Um, but I need to think about it more. But, I think there's a lot of potential for the hand puppets. Mm. Well, yeah. I, I, I know just, I'm just, just this thing. Yeah. Just yes, became exactly. a, a, a weird sort of... Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, 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 so, uh, yeah, straight macaroni or Cheerios or Fruit Loops. I've missed a bunch out, but we don't need to read through them all. I'm going to do more in that pack. Nothing else. Nothing else. Yeah, click clothes pins, adopt a student of the month. Problematic. Practice rocks. I really like cute. that idea yeah. about the eyes open means the parent can help correct and the eyes closed means that they're just listening and enjoy it. I think that's brilliant. Mm. Because yeah. Because sometimes the kids just don't want to be told something they're doing wrong. It's like, just enjoy it. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Which one was that better? That's 26, so find the practice rocks. Oh, yeah. What's this eyes down, eyes down, eyes down? Yeah. Where? As a technique builder, eyes down, eyes down, eyes down, scientists could be hung vertically or horizontally, written upside down, backwards, or into each other. It's like. Is it. Where are you looking at the bottom page? Bottom of 37, number 17. Is it about looking at the bow? As. Is it? I mean. No, it doesn't say. It doesn't give a context. As. as I'm, I think it was mentioned earlier on somewhere, and I was still sort of. That's out of context. It's like it seems. It's been written as, as if it's a given for the technical building. Lots. I don't know what that means. Yes, yeah. We can write to Susan Kempter and ask her. Yeah. I'm sure she's been asked many times. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit strange for a teacher whose whole thing is, you know, like so much of what we do is about making sure that we're being clear to write something that's so specific. Obtuse. But yeah. Yeah. Right. In capital letters. Yeah, three <laughs> times. <laughs> <isn't that? laughs> well, it's a pretty horizontal bit of a kind of and it's like. You get the point of eyes down, right? <laughs> no, but that's just about all of the signs. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, well done, everyone. Good thinking. Um, so, book ones. We are going to finish teaching the ones. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. We did. We already finished teaching the ones. Really? Did, did we finish everything okay. about? Gossip. Okay. Well, it's a gossip, it's an easy one. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we did that last week. <laughs> we missed something out. No, we didn't miss something out, but I thought that we... 
Anyway, let's have a look at it and then we'll make sure we know what we're doing. Just trim that bit off the end of this video. <laughs>